Proverbs, the fourth chapter, and uh, I do want to say, um, now we will have some breaks, sometimes on Wednesday nights, for example, when we do, uh, sometimes I have CSB, sometimes we have uh, things like uh, corporate prayer, that kind of thing, but I think pretty much for the next little while on Wednesday nights, I'm going to be ministering on different angles of prophecy. Uh, so even though we may have a break here and there from it, but we'll be on different angles of it. And uh, last week, I was really curious while I was teaching, it was dead quiet in here. And I even wondered, uh, man, people even understand what I was saying. And then yesterday, I just happened to look and in a few days' time, there was over 90 views watching the Bible study on the archives and something. Okay, well, um, evidently you were listening. <laughs> but uh, animate something. Let me know you're alive. It, it, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, our theme verse in all this prophecy stuff is Proverbs 4 and 5. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. Now to decline thy words from thy mouth, forsake her not, she'll preserve thee, love her, she'll keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. I'm uh, going to, tonight is part two of this teaching that I'm doing on globalism and the uh, one world, or the new world order, and I, again last week as I was teaching, I called it the Star Trek effect, and those of you that were in here know why that I did that. But uh, tonight is part two of this. Let's pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, we love you. Thank you for all of those that are here tonight in Bible study to hear your word. I ask you to bless us tonight as we explore these things. Help us have wisdom. Help us to understand. In Jesus' name, praise God. Shake four people's hands. Tell them you need wisdom to understand. Praise God. <clears throat> All right, y'all having way too much fun. <laughs> Bring up Luke 24, if you would, on screen. I want to touch another uh, point on this wisdom thing. It, re it reminds me on the road to Emmaus when Jesus, uh, you know, appeared... Uh, to some the disciples there, and he said uh, unto them in verse 44, These are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Everybody say me. It's talking about Jesus. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So every generation has to have, has to seek God for wisdom to understand what the scriptures really teach concerning Jesus Christ. Now one of the things we noted last week, and I'm going to do a mix over the next little bit of some recap mixed with some new thoughts that have kind of come to me as we've been digging into all of this. Um, but we talked about the fact that the book of Revelation is primarily... A, the Bible says a revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's a revelation that explains who he is and what he's going to do to finish off time and so forth. Um, now the one world concept that we were talking about last week, I believe is a central part of prophetic eschatology. And the reason that it is is because I think it's very, very key to what we call the second coming which I'm not uh, talking about the rapture at first. I'm talking about the second coming in the light of um, Armageddon and the millennial reign and all of that. Now, of course, somewhere in all of that is also the rapture of the church. And there's different views on when the timing of it is. And we may never know exactly uh, the timing. And I, I think that's purposeful. I think it's hidden uh, on purpose. 
but I am convinced it's futuristic and not historic. Uh, as we talked about last week, one of the views is that all this has been fulfilled and none of it's really futuristic. But here's the problem with that. The millennial reign, according to the scripture, uh, begins immediately after the tribulation. So if the tribulation already occurred uh, in A.D. 70 and so forth, then the millennial reign would have had to have begun, which also means that uh, it would have ended, the millennial reign would have ended over 900 years ago. Uh, so nothing about that preterist view fits into the eschatology of the end of world events. Uh, and, and, and if you're interpreting it as end of world events. Now, some of this, and I, I, I say this jokingly because th there are some things. Bring, bring up uh, uh, that slide too a second. Here's, here's what I'm learning about prophecy. And, and I'm, I'm saying there's enough evidences here to send you down dog trails. <laughs> Rabbit trails, I guess, should be. And, uh, and, and every one of them have some have enough issues to, to create a trail. And so it's interesting. And a lot of things depend on how you interpret certain verses as to which outcome you're going to come to. Um, but some things I'm also noticing may fit. But in order to get them to fit, you really got to shove and push hard. And I thought about these Japanese train pushers. If you've ever seen a video... Uh, of, of, of I, this is one thing about Japanese culture I don't understand. But I, I mean, just thinking, you know, make another train. <laughs> it's an American view of everything, just make more room. <laughs> but they literally are paid. This is in the news even just this week. They've got a raise. They are paid to push and shove people into these trains. Uh <laughs> And I, I don't know what you do if you're the guy who's right inside them, the door's trying to close on you. But anyhow, my point is this is, this is how I'm seeing sometimes various views that, we'll, that we have. There's enough there to, to, that they need consideration, but, but you have to really stretch some things to get some of them to make fit, to, to make it follow through all the way to the end. So of all the various views, of course, we know that only one of them is right. And so we're, that's where the wisdom comes. We've got to seek the Lord. And Daniel chapter 12, if you bring up Daniel again, uh, when Daniel, both this globalization concept prophecy comes from two main prophecies. And this is what we dealt with last week. One is Daniel chapter 7, well, other chapters too, but particularly chapter 7 and also Revelation 13. Now the book of Daniel was written about 550 B.C. The book of Revelation was written between 95 and 97 uh, A.D. Uh, typically 95 is considered the earliest possibility of it. Uh, so the angel is visiting upon Daniel again in the 12th chapter. And he said, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things. And so this is coming toward the end of all the revelation that he's showing Daniel. And Daniel's admitting, God, I don't understand what you're showing me. I need you to help me understand. And then watch the answer. He said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. So basically what he's saying is, Daniel, don't worry about it. This vision has nothing to do with your time. You're not going to see it. You're not going to ever understand it. I don't need you to understand it. I just need you to write it down. <laughs> because there's a futuristic generation that's going to need to know these things. But notice that the vision is not for Daniel's time. It was specifically for the end of times. So we're talking about the very end of, of, of times. Now, we know that 70 A.D. was not the end of times. Unless you interpret it as it's only talking about Israel. 
But I don't believe that it was Tom Butler. I think when you look at the visions that God gave Daniel, they don't fit uh, into the 70 AD narrative unless you're, you got one of them subway pushers going on, mm-hmm. trying to make it fit. And I don't think it fits comfortably. Um, I think one of the reasons that that teaching came about was we had gone so long Uh, almost 1900 years with Israel not being a nation and so you know nature of whores a vacuum and sometimes when there hasn't been an an answer to things that we've been saying at some point it becomes a temptation to try to start creating other rationales as to what it could be and I get that Um, but the thing that occurs to me is once Ezekiel chapter 37, you, you remember that's when the Lord showed the prophet the valley of dry bones. He said, can these bones live? And we know that that was a direct prophecy, he said, about the nation of Israel. So for 1900 years, it could have been argued maybe that, well, it, it didn't mean future because it, it must have already happened because it's been so long. But when 1948 came along, and all of a sudden, the fig tree bloomed again, that argument should have put aside the historical argument. To acknowledge and say, all right, that that, that can't be correct then, because it has to be Ezekiel 37. That is being fulfilled. And if that's the case, then again, the thing I'm learning with prophecy Whichever path you go down, it's, it's like dominoes. You know, if I start down, okay, click, oh, no, no, this way. Click, 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 you know. And everything starts affecting the next thing. And so there are times you're, you and I are going to have to adjust our problems. That's why when I'm teaching on this prophecy, I'm, I'm being very upfront and saying, this is how I see it and understand it as of today. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, I, I had some things that I kind of saw uh, that really were amazing to me just in the seven days since last Wednesday night. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not so dogged about the position on a couple of things, uh, but I am saying this is where I'm at now, unless, unless something new comes to my mind. Another thing I think we need to be careful of, the Scripture did warn us not to be taken in by... Uh, doctrines that would say Jesus has already come. Uh, So we need to be careful about that as well. Now, let's go back to what we were talking about last week. Daniel saw a vision of four kingdoms. Uh, A lion, eagle, a bear, and a leopard. And of course the eagle wings were on the lion but broke off and created another kingdom who was in the form of a man that had had the heart of a man, and we believe that is obviously, to me, that's the United States that broke off of England, became Uncle Sam, as we were talking about uh, last week. But Daniel saw these kingdoms, and the whole point is this. These four kingdoms were kingdoms that did not exist when Daniel was writing about them. But according to what the angel told Daniel, He said, this is about the times of the end. So that the generation of whom the ends of the earth are come are going to see these kingdoms operating at that time. Now, Daniel never understood all that. He just shared it. Holy men of old were moved on and, and, and wrote as they were moved on by the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? And so... Uh, The kingdoms, now it is also true, this is another thing I I needed to address from last week that I didn't. It is true that there are uh, other kingdoms. For example, we we identified the lion as uh, England. Now it is true that other uh, nations have a lion in their logo. However, uh, and an eagle for that matter. Germany uh, has a a black eagle that's in their thing. But, so you could, the question is, well, how come we chose 
And why did the scholars choose those particular kingdoms? It's because they not only fit the mold of, uh, you know, of what he said was going to come, but it also fits the other descriptions of what was given about those countries. So, for example, uh, England uh, was a lion that had eagle's wings, and the wings were plucked off and flew away into another and created another kingdom. Uh, the bear, uh, which is identified as Russia, uh, again was a, a violent kingdom with meat uh, in its mouth and bloodshed that was there. A again, uh, there's a couple other countries that have a bear in their flag, but they don't fit that description. So, it, it, you know, so, the, the, that's the, so the answer to somebody ask you, well, there's other countries, how do you know it's those? Well, this, this is why. And there's no other country that I see fits uh, America uh, as, uh, as good as America does. And, and here's the thing, and the other one's Germany. Uh, now, the reason is Germany, because Germany was originally a big, big part of what was known as the, uh, the early Roman Empire. And it was a big part of Europe. And so the interesting thing is that when Daniel saw this, I want to remind you, they were four kingdoms divided. So when Daniel saw the future end time governments, he said, but they were not in conjunction with one another at all. And remember, by the way, the reason that we come up with Germany representing the leopard is because we were told about that particular uh, thing that one of the kingdoms would have four separate heads. And that actually fits the history of Germany. They started as the old Roman Empire, uh, but when you study the history of Germany and the German people and the German Empire, it has had three major renovations, and the fourth is, is emerging right now, historically. Uh, so this kingdom would have four heads. The German word for head is Reich. So that's why we referred to Hitler in Nazi Germany as the Third Reich. We were basically, it meant the third head. And so that, that head was destroyed. And now Germany is in its fourth metamorphosis of kingdoms. And so I'm just giving the reasons why they fit these things and not uh, so much others. Um, now, the head would be mortally wounded, but healed, according to what uh, Daniel saw, or what John saw. Uh, Hitler's Third Reich uh, that rose up, it is possible that it could be referring to that in so much as American and Allied forces in World War II uh, broke that kingdom, divided Germany into East Germany and West Germany. The Berlin Wall went up. It stayed divided for 20-some years. I can't remember the exact number. It's interesting that in October uh, 29th of 2009, just 10 years ago, uh, the headline of USA Today paper in referring to this story is, The wound is healed, but the scars remain. <laughs> and it was even interesting that the headlines of it, they're saying, they're viewing Germany as having a severe wound, but now it's being healed, and a new thing is emerging. One thing is sure, the First Reich was considered a part of the, the, the old Roman Empire, and Germany, uh, when John saw the vision, he saw all of these four kingdoms as one beast. And the body of that beast was the leopard. So that, mean, that tells me that ultimately when it comes to the countries that are leading this end time kingdom, Germany will be the dominant factor. Won't be the only one, but it'll be a dominant one. It's the predominant one. It had a body of a leopard. Now, and of course, when John saw it, there was a body of a leopard, feet of a bear, a mouth of a lion, and then, of course, he said there was a, a, a dragon that was given its power to the whole thing, making it work. Now, some, uh, I'm understanding, are thinking that maybe that's China. Uh, well, the only problem with that is uh, China doesn't have the power to 
energize things. The, the scripture seems to indicate to me that the dragon is talking about Antichrist. And here's what's interesting. I, I did a little research the last couple of days, and I was interested in knowing about these four kingdoms. And uh, America, of course, wasn't established until 1776. We're the, we're the puppies uh, of kingdoms. <laughs> Russia, or you know, some, some of the modern day script of it, was formed in 1703. The German Empire can date back to 1871, and Great Britain back to 1707. Now, all of these lands were populated before then, but various other kingdoms and so forth. Here's what's interesting. The lion became known as the animal symbol of England long before England was formed and when they officially took on the symbol of the lion. Now, here's where it came from. That dates all the way back to 1180 when King Richard I, uh, and you've heard him in history, he's known as Richard the Lionhearted. And it's an interesting story as to why, which we don't have time for tonight. But that was the time. So here's, here's my point. I'm going to say, okay, even though England wasn't the modern version of what we have today, let's go back to then and pick up that date. The oldest possible date is 1180. Now what that means is if you use the oldest reference to all this, it means that Daniel's vision was a full 1,730 years prior to its fulfillment. And, of course, it wasn't even totally fulfilled. I'm saying till it began fulfillment, if all of these predictions and interpretations are correct. That means it was 2,326 years before America was founded. Now, folks, that's a prophecy. <laughs> Those that like to say the Bible is just some old book written by, you know, man, that has nothing to do with it. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> This is the kind of stuff that proves the existence of God. Because Daniel prophesied things about what was going to come at the end of times. 2,000 years before the nations even existed. John wrote the book of Revelation 650 years after Daniel. So he, I'm sure, was familiar with Daniel's writing as a student of the Old Testament. I believe John knew that when he saw this animal that was the lion, the bear, and the leopard as one beast, I think John knew that he was seeing the same thing that Daniel did. But what was strange about it was when Daniel saw it, they were four diverse kingdoms, and now he's seeing them as one. And again, the interesting thing is the eagle's not there. So these four kingdoms, seen hundreds of years before the existence, will become one kingdom, the body of the leopard, it'll be predominant, the feet of the bear, the mouth of the lion. And then he said there's something about it. Bring up slide three. There's something about this animal that is different than anything that's ever been seen in history. It's going to have seven heads and ten horns, and on the horns, ten crowns. Now, I suppose that's about as good of an artist's rendition as you could come up with trying to depict what John saw in his vision. And upon the heads, the Bible says, was the name blasphemy. So that's why I go back to the dragon. It's probably not China. It was the Antichrist. Now, no matter how you cut it, that is one nasty-looking critter. <laughs> I would not want to encounter that critter. Now, the seven heads represented seven combined kingdoms. We talked about that last week. The one head uh, would have represented the lion, which was England. The one head would represent the bear, which was Russia. The now, remember, the leopard had four heads. So if it is correctly judged as Germany then that's six heads. The seventh head was represented as one head, but it was made up of ten horns 
and ten crowns. In other words, it is a consortium of ten nations that are counted as the seventh head. And so it fits. You know. Now, again, America was not listed, and we talked about that. Um, look, the bottom line is the Bible doesn't tell us why or what happened. It's left to conjecture. But there's only a two or three possibilities. One, uh, we know that a war is coming. It's going to kill, uh, what, 25% or so or, or more of the population of the world. It is possible that America was attacked nuclearly, and we were just crippled to the point that we weren't really even mattering as a world power anymore, but we're still here. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that there could be an economic catastrophe that would destroy America's ability to be a superpower. And to be honest with you, that one didn't hard, that wouldn't be, you don't need a train pusher for that when you consider we have $23 million, trillion dollar debt. Y'all being quiet, are, are, is anybody alive still? Are you still? <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the <clears throat> which brings the thing, we could still be there, but just not a superpower, and therefore wasn't mentioned. That's a possibility. I hope none of them are right. <laughs> but there is a fourth possibility, and that is, of course, that uh, America's history since the, our founding, and you notice we were founded in 1776, but we didn't get our strength as a superpower until World War II. And it is immediately after World War II that Israel came together again as a nation. And on the very day that they were to be uh, you know, created legally, they were attacked of their enemies. But it was the American Eagle that stepped in and kept it at bay. So it's interesting to me that God formulated a kingdom that has a purpose. And from the moment, literally within a decade of when we became a military superpower, we started exercising that as a protectorate of the nation of Israel and have been ever since. So it is not uh, unlikely or it's not a stretch to presume that the reason that America wasn't listed as the eagle in John's vision, and this is the one I hope is, I'm hoping that it's because we're not a part of the one world system and that we're one of the sheep nations that's standing against uh, this world system. Now, there is a, a possibility of why that could be, and that is because of America's deep tradition in Christian and biblical training that knows what this stuff is. Now, you wouldn't think so in the current generation, but there's still a lot of old folks around that, that, that know a lot of this. And, of course, God is stirring revival all at the same time. So it's very possible there's a chapter in Revelation We'll get to it later, I'm sure, that talks about during the time of the tribulation and Armageddon, when attacks are uh, coming in to destroy Israel, which we know was the mother, or the woman, excuse me, that was uh, mentioned in the book of Revelation, but their well, eagle's wings came and, and picked her up and put her into safety. It could be that America will continue to fulfill its role uh, all the way into Armageddon. Now, again, we wouldn't do that if we're part of the one world system. So that's the thinking behind it. Um, last week, we ended, bring up slide four. We read, and I'm not going to take the time to do it again, but we read the entire passage that had to do with Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Daniel interpreted. And <clears throat> Daniel came to Nebuchadnezzar and he saw future kingdoms that would come and go. But remember, God told Daniel that this stuff that you're seeing is not all for your time. It's all coming later. So the first kingdom he identified was the Babylonian kingdom, which was the head of gold. But then he, then he interpreted to Nebuchadnezzar, there's another kingdom coming after yours. Now we know historically the next major kingdom that took control of Europe during that time is the Medo-Persian War, and that represented, is represented by the breast and the arms of silver. They were a very powerful kingdom, and uh, 
Uh, as a matter of fact, they ruled with, uh, with a rod of iron in many ways, and that's why sometimes you'll hear preachers even joke about uh, if something's set in stone, uh, they'll make a joke about being the law of the Medes and the Persians, you know, because there wasn't no questioning it. Uh, that was a strong kingdom. The next kingdom that came along was ancient Greece, which was represented by the belly and the thighs of brass. And then he said another great kingdom will come along that will dominate Europe, and that is uh, what we know to be the ancient Roman Empire. It would be noted by legs of iron, and that was because it would become a split kingdom during its time. Now, these four kingdoms rose up and ended within a few hundred years of Daniel's vision. But the stuff that he was writing later in chapter 12, he said, this is sealed until the end of times. So there's been a, a large gap between uh, what happened. When, when you study Daniel's uh, 70 weeks vision, we can trace through and explain all 69 weeks. And we know the 70th week is the tribulation week, or Jacob's trouble. But what we're trying to figure out is, well, how come it's not happening? Now, you can interpret it that it did happen in 70 AD. I don't think that's the correct interpretation because it doesn't fit other things. But the, the one explanation that is possible is that there, there is a time gap, and this is what's considerably uh, usually accepted as the thinking on it, and that's the Gentile church age. The Gentiles were engrafted into the promises that God made to Israel, and the New Testament church uh, was brought into effect in Acts chapter 2. When the New Testament church age ends, then there's nothing withholding Daniel's 70th week. Now, again, I'm not even getting into predicting when that rapture is, but I'm just saying it, it, it all fits. I, I'm going to tell you what I'm wanting to do in this teaching over the next few weeks. If nothing else, I want to stir up in your spirit, and this is what I felt the Lord speak to me about. I want to stir my church about where we are. God's ready to do revival. By the way, speaking of that, we just got confirmation today that the, the signatures are all in and our contracts are signed. We are now under contract to purchase that church, little church building in Hampton uh, that we're going to do. Now, it's not closed yet. We have 60 days for due diligence and a lot of things to do. And assuming that we don't run into anything crazy, uh, we're assuming we're going to close it. But anyway, I feel like in 2020, the Lord is putting the church back on offense. We've been on defense a long time, but we're on offense now. We got the ball, and we're moving it down the field. And I think one of the things that needs to happen for us to get on board with that is the Lord wants to stir us. And uh, so I, I'm thinking, I hope this teaching just stirs something in you to realize it's time to stop goofing around. We are, we are in a serious biblical time, amen? So the last kingdom that Daniel saw in the vision on the picture there, you'll notice he had feet of iron and clay mixed. Now this was a kingdom that had not yet come in history yet. We believe it is what we call the revived Roman Empire. And here's why. Because it is, the feet are part of the legs of Rome. But it, it's, it's, it's something different. In other words, it's a little bit like the legs, but not just like. It's feet of iron and clay, and it's a mixture. He said the last kingdom, Daniel, that is going to be in operation when the coming of the Lord occurs is a what we call uh, in theology a revived Roman Empire. In other words, it's a kingdom that is going to have the mixture of Rome. It's going to have a lot of the same elements of the old Roman Empire, but it is not going to be one kingdom. It's going to be made up of a consortium of nations, ten toes, ten horns. And whether you interpret that to mean ten different nations or that each means ten more and it's twenty, no matter how you lay it out, uh, it's still something that has never quite been seen on the earth. 
And it'll be pretty easy to understand when it's happening. I personally believe that a lot of this has to do with the European uh, common market, the European Union uh, that is involved today, bringing Europe together again for the first time in centuries. I also believe for this to happen, there's going to have to be a, uh, a getting along of Catholicism along with Islam. Because those are the two major powers of religion in the Middle East and, and Europe and so forth. And so something's got to happen to bring them into this play. So these ten kings is a second reincarnation, so to speak, or incarnation of the Roman Empire. But it's called the Holy Roman Empire because it is like the first kingdom. Uh, Rome in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages, uh, the Catholic Church ruled with great power and authority. Popes reigned along with kings and so forth. It was really kind of a mix. It's going to be a revival of that. In other words, a revival of politics mixed with religion. By the way, it's why the founders of our nation, when, they, when writing the Constitution, did it in such a way as to keep the government out of church. It wasn't to keep the church out of government. It was to keep the government out of church because they knew they had seen this mess historically. And they knew what had happened in Europe. And they didn't want to see it happen again in North America. So, uh, but it's going to be the Holy Roman Empire because it's going to have a religious context to it. It's going to have an iron, which I think is representative of the physical governments, and a consortium of governments. I think it's going to be the clay is the religious part of it. And because it's all mixed together, it's not one kingdom. It's going to, uh, it's going to struggle to stay together. It wouldn't take a lot to cause it to fall apart. Bring up Revelation 13. So again, John says, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and the deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now let me tell you how powerful this uh, European Union is becoming. Right now, the combined... Uh, GDP economics of the European Union is now larger than the United States economy. So it is going to be the predominant power in the earth, especially when all the world starts getting on board with it. And one of the kingdoms that John saw was this revived Roman Empire, and it, it, it was listed as a Roman Empire, because I believe it goes back to the, to the first right. So John saw a head that was wounded, but it was resurrected. And so I think when we see this thing coming about, what makes it valuable to us is that the Bible says that's the atmosphere that the revival is going to come in. Or, or not, well, not revival, but the, the, the coming of the Lord. Um, this revival or this revived empire, excuse me, it'll be different, or it'll be similar, but it'll be different. Same geography, but a mix of religion and so forth. And this is why the world will see a one-world government order and a religious leader all at the same time. Because it's, they're going to see a leader of clay and a leader of iron. Well, the Bible calls it the beast and the false prophet. Because one represents religion, and one represents secular government. Bring up slide five for a moment. I found this interesting. There is a famous sculptor by the name of Arnaldo Pomodoro, who created a famous statue that depicted the New World Order. And many years ago, he gave it as a gift to the Vatican. Now, that's a picture of it. That's actually the one that sits in the Vatican Kingdom. It sits in Rome. Everybody say Rome. Now, after the United Nations was founded, bring up slide six. Arnando created another one and donated it to the United Nations. That's a picture of the one that sits in New York City today. 
It's interesting that again, uh, and, and I think sometimes the people that are involved in this don't even know what's going on. They're, God's playing chess. But he's given signs and signals that his people can see things. And I just think it's interesting that the two major uh, statues that so now they're in other places now, but the two biggest ones that started all is in Rome and at the United Nations. One world government, one world order, one world religion. That's what they're working on. Now here's the point. We see this stuff coming together in our time. This is why I believe Revelation is futuristic and not historic. Because all this stuff is formulating in our lifetime. Particularly started strong in the 20th century. I believe the 21st century it's going to move like crazy. So listen to the... Go... go uh, Go to Revelation 13 a minute. Listen to the description of the false prophet that's going to come. There's going to be a one world religious order. In verse 11, John described it. He said, I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. In other words, another kingdom. But it rose out of the earth. It wasn't, it wasn't out of any particular thing. It came from all over. And he had two horns. One was like a lamb, and then he, and he er, 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 I'm sorry, he had two horns like a lamb, and then he spake as a dragon. In other words, there's going to come a, 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 a new kingdom in the middle of all this that's going to come up from all around the world. He's going to be a religious leader. He's going to, he's going to have horns like a lamb. That's, that's recognizing his imitation of the church. Of Jesus but he's going to speak like a dragon in other words he's going to be he's not really representing the church he's going to represent Antichrist now in my personal opinion and there's various views on this but it's, it's nothing unique to me is a very common view I personally think that uh, a Pope a Catholic Pope is going to fill that role there's no I mean the Catholic Church literally means universal uh, and there are 1.2 billion Catholics in the world. And they are all over the world. And uh, they're the largest singular religious group that, that has, and they, they even have, the Vatican has embassies in countries. You know, they're already acting like a government. And governments even treat them like one. This is really interesting. Verse 12. Now, this one world religious leader said he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. That's the Roman Empire. And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. It's talking about Rome. Whose deadly wound was healed. So this Antichrist, this, I'm sorry, not the Antichrist, this one world religious leader is going to be on a campaign to turn the attention of religious people and get them to give their allegiance to this beast which is the revived Roman Empire. It's clay and iron mixed. Verse 13, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now he's not going to do this by the power of God, he's going to do it by the power of Satan and Antichrist. And if you don't think he can do it, you might want to remember he already did it in the book of Job. Caused fire to come down trying to make Job think that God was the one doing all this to him. So he's a deceiver from the beginning. And the Bible says, verse eight, uh, 14, And he deceived them that dwell on the earth by any means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had uh, the wound by the sword and did live. It's very interesting graphics. Bring up slide seven. I think that there is no question that he's talking about this last kingdom, the globalization, one world order, the religious leader, which I presume to be the Pope, and there's some other reasons in the book of Revelation I think point to that, but he is going to, he's going to help bring this thing together. Because the truth of the matter is, if you're going to get governments together, one of the hurdles you've got to get over is religion and religious differences. And that's why this pope 
is particularly interesting because he's the first one I've seen that's making all kinds of overtures to the Muslims. As a matter of fact, the first pope that I know of that ever went and worshipped in a, in a mosque. Because he's already working it, trying to bring the kingdoms together. One world economic, or one world ecumenical system. Now, all of this happens under the context of globalism. It all happens under the context of a new world order. And so this will now be a consortium of kingdoms that are flowing together, totally driven and powered by Antichrist. But then the Bible says that there will be a little horn that will rise up out of the other horns and take control of, of the others. In other words, he's going to rise up and become the ruler and dominate the other horns. I think that that is talking about the Antichrist. Uh, he'll grant power and authority to this final world leader, and Antichrist is going to rule this thing. So again, within a few years of the end of World War II, America is now a superpower, and Israel, for the first time in 1900 years, is formulated together to become a nation in 1948. Now, what's interesting is a few years after that, right in the early 1950s, six European nations came together and decided it's time to start repairing Europe and to begin the process of establishing a new European empire. And they literally met in Rome and they signed an agreement that is known as the Treaty of Rome. And the purpose of it is to begin a new world conglomerate. West Germany, France, Italy, the Netherlands, and Belgium, and Luxembourg. There were six nations to start. But they announced their new vision as the Big Ten. Because they said, our goal is to have ten nations in this to begin it. Now within a few years another four nations joined and created the beginning of what became known as the European Common Market. Now the European Common Market has since then morphed into a bigger kingdom, so to speak, called the European Union. And that was formed in 1993. So this stuff's happening fast. From a prophetic standpoint anyway. So, go back to Daniel, chapter 2. And, and I'm going back to verse 42 a minute. And I want to remind you what it says about this, this, this kingdom. As the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with the miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not when it's mixed with clay. So the European Union that was founded in 1993 that came directly from the common market, that was founded by the ten nations, now actually has uh, more nations than that in it. But if you're just considering the original founding nations, most prophecy teachers tend to think that when John saw the ten horns, it would probably mean that at some point there are three key nations that are maybe going to remove themselves from the European Union to go back to the seven that John saw. Now, if that's correct, i tell you what's very interesting to me is the last two years, this whole Brexit thing going on. And you'll notice what a stir it is. I mean, it's, they're, they're fighting all over, but you know, us in America, they, you know, what's the big deal? <laughs> but Europeans are wound up about this. And, and England uh, is demanding things change in the UN, or, I mean the EU, to fix some things before they would reconsider uh, being a part of it. 
Now, it is possible that they may not exit, that it'll fix it, or it'll come back in it, in the sense that John did say that, the, that the, it had a head of a lion. However, there's another way to view that. And that is, it, it, he didn't say it had a headline, he said it had a mouth of a lion. And the mouth means that's how it talks. What's going to be the language of the one world government? If it turns out that it happens to be English, then voila. <laughs> you have an understanding of what the mouth of the lion is. And my point is, is it may not necessarily have to have England in it in order to have the mouth of the lion. Just talking out loud. Now, go back to Daniel 2 again. This time, verse 44. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Everybody say forever. So he said it's in the days of those kings, in the days of of the seven-head animal in the days of the ten horn kingdoms or the ten toes he said God of heaven is going to set up another kingdom and another government that's going to stand forever for as much thou, as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of a mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron the brass and the clay and the silver and the gold the great God made known unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure. Bring up slide eight. Now here's another reason why I don't believe that Revelation is historic. Because the Bible teaches that in the days of this consortium or in the days of that toes of Daniel's vision that another kingdom is going to be set up by God that's going to live forever. None of that has happened yet. So it's obvious it's a futuristic thing. Now, again, don't think for a moment that the Bible is just some garbled old writing. Only God could have authored something so profoundly accurate thousands of years in advance. So it appears that the kingdoms will formulate this new world order, this globalist kingdom. We, we, use, we hear the term globalization, new world order, whatever, whatever you want to call it. It fits the description of what John saw. I call it the Star Trek effect. And, and the world government, now here's what you need to know, the world's going to receive it. Because it's going to be, in their eyes, the answer to a lot of things. And, and it will help some things in the beginning. However, it's going to be a horrible thing. Because the Bible says it's going to wreak havoc on anything in the earth that's having to do with Jesus. That's Israel for sure and the church at some point up until whenever the church is removed. It's going to be havoc and bloodshed until, everybody say until, until the rock comes out of the heavens and it smashes the feet and all the kingdoms fall. And that's, that, that rock is Jesus Christ. That's what he was referring to when he said, you either fall on the rock and be broken, or the rock will fall on you and grind you into powder. So the rock is the kingdom of God or the millennial reign that's going to follow the destruction of the toes. So the final superpower in the kingdom or in the earth is not going to be the Antichrist or anything else, it's not going to be America, it's not going to be, any, it's going to be God's kingdom. I think somebody ought to worship God right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Go back to Revelation 13 a minute. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months, which is three and a half years. So the first half of Daniel's 70th week 
is being ruled by this end time consortium. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and to blaspheme his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. In other words, anything that represents God for three and a half horrible years, there's going to be tribulation. It won't be great tribulation. That's coming in the second half. But this one world kingdom powered by Satan himself and Antichrist and the one world religious leader will come and begin its rule with the creation of a peace treaty. Now we know that because the Bible talks about it, number one. We'll get into that in a minute, but it also makes sense in that there's no way that these things can be fulfilled until this religious issue gets solved. So there's going to have to be a treaty between uh, Catholicism and Islam and Israel and the Palestinians because all of that is the stuff stirring war in the earth today. And the Bible, bring up uh, slide nine. Uh, here, here's the thing. That's a picture of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. I know many of us have been there. But on the Temple Mount, incredibly historic site, the Muslims, when they had rule of the city, built their holy mosque there. Now the problem is, and this is because the devil chose this site very particular, because he knew that when what John wrote in the book of Revelation was that there would be a third temple renewed of Israel that's going to be on that same spot. So the devil says, I'll fix that. I'll put a mosque there. Well, I got news for you. That mosque, that, that, that mosque is going to move <laughs> at some point. Or, or they'll come to a peace agreement where the tabernacle will be set up right next to it and operate with peace. It'll be a great peace. And whoever brokers it will be the greatest political leader of the world at that time. That's why everybody wants to solve this problem. Islamists represent over a billion people in population. And they control the Temple Mount but from a religious standpoint. Now, the Bible ticks that Israel is going to have a third temple with, with renewed Old Testament animal sacrifices. And this will be the temple that Antichrist is going to walk into at the three and a half year middle of the tribulation mark and proclaim himself as God. That's what the Bible calls the desolation of, of abomination, or abomination of desolation. I'm telling you, you start swimming in this prophecy stuff, it, 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 trying to keep it all straight. <laughs> now, we know that Israel is working right now. They got everything they need to build the temple, have animal sacrifices back. They have found ashes of a red heifer. They got everything they need. They say now that Israel has everything they need to renew this prophecy within 90 days of getting the green light to do it. It's called the Temple Faithful Movement. And they're ready to move. I mean, they're, they're ready. But the Dome of the Rock is Muslim. And so something has to happen to bring peace to all this. Now, while our nation is all fussed up about our president and his occasional antics, what's not in the news is all the amazing things he's doing that's fulfilling prophecy and fixing some things that's helping the church and slowing down this process. He's not going to stop it, but he's slowing it down a little bit. And, and by the way, that's why they're so angry. That's what it's about. It, it's got nothing to do with any of the stuff that they're charging with. That's weak. It has to do with the fact that he is systematically dismantling a lot of things of the political left, and they are so angry they can't see straight. 
Now, the rest of the world doesn't feel the same way about it. As a matter of fact, Israel loves President Trump. I got a two and a half minute video clip that somebody put together on this topic that was filmed. This is Prime Minister Netanyahu giving his speech last year on May 18th, when they were, or May 14th, excuse me, when they were dedicating the American Embassy in Jerusalem, which American Congress voted to do back in the early 90s. And no president had the intestinal fortitude to just do it. I want to tell you why God is using uh, Donald Trump. It certainly and because he's a perfect, perfect vessel. <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> but I tell you what he is. I have never seen a guy that has such a strong, acid willpower. I mean, it's amazing. And the more you push on him, he can't help himself. He just, he pushes back. And I, I really feel like, and I'm talking to Fred, I've talked to a lot of apostolic people who feel the exact same way. I want to tell you what God did. I think God looked at it and I said, you know, I can use that. He's going to be a one-man wrecking ball. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, play the play, play clip real quick. Let me show you how they feel in Israel. And of course, I want to especially welcome Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump. Your presence here today is a, a testament to the importance of this occasion, not only for the Trump administration, but in a very personal way for you. For you, each of you, for the pursuit of peace, and for President Trump himself. Thank you. Dear friends, what a glorious day. Remember this moment. This is history. President Trump, by recognizing history, you have made history. So for me, this spot brings back personal memories but for our people, it evokes profound collective memories of the greatest moments we have known on this city on a hill. In Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, Abram passed the greatest test of faith and the right to be the father of our nation. In Jerusalem, King David established our capital 3,000 years ago. In Jerusalem, King Solomon built our temple, built our temple built our temple, which stood for many centuries. In Jerusalem, Jewish exiles from Babylon rebuilt the temple, rebuilt the temple, rebuilt the temple, which stood for many more centuries. In Jerusalem, the Maccabees rededicated that temple, rededicated that temple, and restored Jewish sovereignty in this land. And it was here in Jerusalem, some 2,000 years later, that the soldiers of Israel spoke three immortal words, Hal Abayt Beadenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. The Temple Mount is in our hands, is in our hands. Words that lifted the spirit of the entire nation. We are in Jerusalem and we are here to stay. Now the reason that video clip was made is because prophetic people that study all this say and, and political students say that what the prime minister was doing in that speech was noting the historical day that this is and he referenced of all the things of history he could reference he referenced the first temple mount or first temple he referenced the second that was rebuilt and in essence what he was doing is said we are here to stay he was sending the signal to everybody that understands that stuff, and particularly to the Jewish people, that we are going to build this third temple. Prophecy is being unfolded like never before in our eyes. Now, you can't have a Jewish holy temple 
and an Islamic holy spot at the same ground without war. So there has to come a peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinians and even with the Muslims, above all. And when that peace treaty, now on another occasion, we'll talk about that peace treaty, there are several key things that are elements that have to be in it to be the one that we're looking for. And I don't have time for that night. Matter of fact, I'm pretty much out of time now. But um, we'll, we'll get to that later. But, but here's the point I want you to see. When that peace treaty is signed, it is the trigger that begins Daniel's 70th week. In other words, the tribulation will be upon us. Now, the first half of it will be peace in Jerusalem because of the peace treaty. But for three and a half years, that one world system is going to persecute uh, anything that's connected with God in the earth. And then by the time he gets in, bring up uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Daniel is seeing all this, and he prophesies, and he said, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's talking about the peace treaty. And in the midst of the week, or in other words, three and a half years into the seven, he shall cause the sacrifice of oblation to cease. That's why we know animal sacrifices are going to start again, because he's going to bring it to an end. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. So the Antichrist is going to go into the temple three and a half years into this peace treaty and all Hades is going to break loose. He's going to break the treaty. War will begin with Israel. And now the second half of the tribulation is going to have atrocities even greater than the first. So in the Middle East, or, in the, or excuse me, in the middle of the tribulation, this, there will be total global power and Antichrist is going to be revealed. Ironically, the world will not see Antichrist for who he is until it's too late. There will be nothing they can do. And so most of all these prophecies, including the book of Revelation, by the way, tend to relate to Israel much more than the church, which is where we're going to get into some very interesting topics down the road. Amen. Let's stand. I am out of time. Somebody, Pastor, I wish you'd finish. No, you don't. <laughs> We'd be here in the morning and still wouldn't have it figured out. <laughs> we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, the closer we get, the clearer it's becoming. But one thing is for sure, we are in the season of the coming of the Lord. I'm not so much worried about the second coming, that's Armageddon. I'm worried about the rapture. I want to know when the church is going out of here. And the Bible doesn't give us an exact answer on it. But I know it's in that season when all this is going on. <laughs> Hallelujah. All this started in the 20th century. It is my firm conviction that the 21st century is going to see the culmination of all this stuff. And it's unfolding fast. Praise God. Lift up your voice and begin to praise God right now. Just thank Him. <laughs> Jesus, I love you. Lord, I thank you for your word tonight. I ask you to stir this word in the hearts of your people. Deal with us about this stuff. Make us interested in this. And give us wisdom. In Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands to the Lord? Give God a shout of victory and praise. <laughs>